What's up, brand nerds? You're listening to another podcast of Brands, Beats, and Bites. Hope you all have been well. You all uh, know me to at the beginning, off the rip, I'll say something, and uh, sometimes it might be lighthearted or funny, uh, but not this time, brand nerds, not this time. As you all know, a few weeks ago in uh, Lahaina, in Maui, uh, there was a horrific fire. 115 people lost their lives. That number is likely to go up. Just today in Johannesburg, 74 people lost their lives. That number is also likely to go up. In both places, while in different parts of the world, they lost their lives in a fire, these, these humans, these, uh, these people of our family, the world community. What may be in common with these uh, with these folks is uh, I'm going to guess very few of any of them went to bed at night and said, you know what, tomorrow morning, I'd like not to be here anymore. Very few of any. Which brings me to this, brand nerds. Um, we don't know how much time we have in this life. None of us do. We don't know the time. We don't know the place. What we do know is that throughout life, there will be forks in the road when we meet them. And we can go one way or another. And I will tell you that, Brand Nerds, what I used to do in my uh, younger um, self is I would pick a road and go, you know, I think there might be more spoils over on the on the left side. There might be some recognition on the left side. On the right side was more, what was what would be congruent with my soul? What, what would be good for humanity overall? And what I learned, Brand Nerds, is when I would pick the right lane in the fork, and that was about humans, that was about goodness that was about uh, sharing of gifts and receiving of gifts every single time it worked out. Conversely, brand nerds, when I picked the left side for some recognition or reward or remuneration, every single time it did not work out. <laughs> so the, it, it, uh, I'm telling you, brand nerds, it was like a correlation factor of one both ways. Yep. I mentioned this LT because today we have a very dear friend of mine in the building who has met these forks in the road and has chosen the right side, the human side, the good side. And um, it is my honor and distinct pleasure LT for us to have a brand's beats and bites with this brother in the building today. Yes, indeed, DC. You said that. Ooh, what a great setup. We have Roger Fishman in the house today. Welcome, Roger. Hello. Thanks for having me, everybody. Good to see you guys again. It's been a long, long, very long time. Mm. It, it, mm. it has, Roger. So, mm. okay, for our brand nerds, uh, Roger, we have to say straight up, we have another great guest who worked with us at Coca-Cola HQ on North Avenue in the ATL. Let's get into Roger's amazing background of brand nerds. He has done a whole lot more than market sugar water. So got to check this out. So I'm going to go back to the beginning. Roger was born at Yale Hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. Grew up in Orange, a small town near New Haven. Brand nerds, when I encountered Roger at Coca-Cola, I viewed him as a high-flying exec who was in the process of taking the business world by storm, which, as you will see, he really has. I also had no clue that Roger grew up with parents who fought like crazy including occasionally police having to intercede, and they eventually divorced when Roger was, was still young. Although Roger's dad was a doctor, they had financial difficulties, which were made especially acute when Roger's dad died of a heart attack when Roger was just 13. And Roger's mom worked as a dental hygienist for $2 an hour from 6.30 a.m. to 7 p.m. In elementary school, Roger was on food stamps, and a special angel enters Roger's life, and her name is Mrs. Tracy. Mrs. Tracy is the principal of Rogers Elementary School, and understanding Roger was too embarrassed to use food stamps in front of his classmates, 
she has Roger come visit her and the nurse privately in the nurse's, nurse's office where she shares the importance of eating and nutrition in order to be a focused and good student. And she also offers Roger a quarter every day without anyone knowing about it, just their secret. In this moment, Roger learns the profound lesson about kindness, giving someone dignity, and the importance of helping those who need extra help. More context here. Even with these difficulties, Roger says his parents were super smart, well-read, curious, creative, and connected to the world. And he remembers at a super young age, maybe six or seven, his parents taking him to a drag show in P-Town, Provincetown on the Cape in Massachusetts. Additionally, his parents taught him to think and live independently and not to follow the crowd for the sake of fitting in. In high school, Roger plays basketball and baseball and captains both varsity teams. He is driven to succeed. And he always believed that if you work smarter and harder and longer, that he could create joy and success in sports and anything he tries in life. Roger then goes on to my alma mater, George Washington University in DC, which is really cool. In Roger's junior year, he takes Advertising 101 and it is taught by Sam Thurm, who had previously been the head of media at Unilever and is credited for the effective and strategic Ring Around the Collar campaign. For the younger brand nerds out there, this campaign was incredibly well known for whisk laundry detergent. Roger quickly becomes enamored with the class and finds himself sitting in the front row. And by the way, he keeps doing that from then on. And following Professor Thurm after class, inquiring about what he teaches about the industry and ultimately how to get into this world and start his career. So one day, Roger asked him about getting an internship. And he says something to the effect of, kid, you have no experience. You have no real practical knowledge about the industry. So you have little to offer but enthusiasm, energy, and being free labor. That's the key for nerds here. So taking this advice, Roger leaves his paying job in college for a free internship at ad agency stalwart Needham, Harper, and Steers. Roger is now literally and figuratively in the building. Check out what he does next, brand nerds. With the gracious help of Don Toomey, Roger sends out 50 resumes for a summer internship prior to his final semester at GW. Two of the agencies are open to an inter internship, but they keep Roger waiting and waiting. We've all been there, brand nerds. Finally, he takes all of his money and sends both agencies a dozen multicolored helium balloons with a note saying, are you ready for this? I am still up in the air waiting to hear from you. Now, this is target marketing. So one middle-aged conservative man passes, but the other, Andy Meyer, the smart, creative, dynamic young woman account supervisor, loves this proactive approach and offers Roger the final internship position at Wonderman, Ricotta, and Klein. This internship leads to a full-time job at the agency where he learns database direct marketing, working on Timeline Books, uh, IBM, and Prodigy, which is really at the beginning of the internet. Now Roger gets a chance to really join ad agency stalwart at the time, SSC&B, which was an IPG shop, who eventually becomes Lintas and, and Amirati and Purist. Those are names that folks might remember. With stellar accounts at ssc &B, such as Diet Coke, Unilever, and more. Seems like a no-brainer, but it's also two levels down from Wonderman and 33% pay cut. Roger go ba goes back to Professor Thurm and he says, and, and Professor Sir Thurm says to him, look, Roger, it's the largest packaged goods agency in the world with the most powerful brands. Take the job. And Roger listens to Professor Thurm. At this agency, he works super hard on numerous great accounts, including Diet Coke, working with celebs just such as Whitney Houston, Pierce Brosnan, L. McPherson uh, with Diet Coke. And he also works, gets to work on Unilever and CoverGirl. Roger is doing top level work at the, on the agency side. So now here, folks, this is a big pivot, as DC was talking about. Now he gets recruited by our friends on North Avenue at Coca-Cola, where he is first recruited for brand management, which Roger wasn't really interested in. And then he is recruited for an entertainment marketing position, which he accepts. He stewards the entertainment marketing at Coca-Cola, creating and executing programs with Hollywood, the music industry, the Olympics, NFL, NBA, to name a few. And he gets to collaborate with some of the most innovative minds to create one-of-a-kind marketing programs with folks such as CNC Music Factory, Elton John, Steven Spielberg, at, at the time, Amblin Entertainment, Batman, Warner Brothers, et cetera. After doing this for three years, he moves over to the marketing to be marketing director at Coca-Cola for the Burger King business, which is on the fountain side, which is a big deal at Coca-Cola, which of course was one of uh, Coca-Cola's largest customers. So now 
he gets recruited to go to Hard Rock Cafe. And brand nerds, it's hard to describe, but at the time, Hard Rock Cafe is super successful, high-flying uh, restaurant at the time. And Rogers brought in to be the worldwide head of marketing. This is an amazing and wild ride. He opens new locations in places like Copenhagen and Madrid, and he leads the first ever global marketing campaign and new mo menu rollout in its history. From Hard Rock, Roger dips his toes into the entrepreneurial tech waters, becoming EVP of marketing for TeleTV, which he coins his successful failure. Because D, check this out. Here's what you're talking about with pivots, right? With forks in the road. Roger quickly pivots and joins News Corp, first as SVP of marketing and is soon promoted to EVP, where he also serves on the company's worldwide management committee. Highlights there include developing the framework and launching the company's first three-year planning, leading the synergy for the launch of Family Guy, working on the digital launch of B Sky B, which was also in the Murdoch family of companies, and managing the business side of, at the time, uh, News Corp owned the Los Angeles Dodgers. So after that, he joins uh, ePartners in London, which is a VC firm, which is a joint venture of News Corp. So that's the connection there. But Roger soon come, goes back to LA to become head of corporate marketing brand nerds for a place called CAA. Most people really know what CAA is. The, the biggest uh, agency and stalwart in Hollywood making everything happen and actually in the sports world now too. Highlights at CAA include leading business development where his strategy and pitch for attracting clients was very simple. The quote is, in the traditional media world, you were at the end of the food chain. With CAA, you were at the front of the food chain. Clearly, this work where he brings on major corporations such as Procter & Gamble, Nextel, Abercrombie & Fitch, to name a few. At this point, Roger does what he always wants to do. At that point, he's at CAA, but he always wanted to start his own company. And Roger, do I have it pronounced? It is, is it the Zizo Group? How did yes, you pronounce it? That's it. Okay. And that stands for Zoom In and Zoom Out. And they are a pioneer in the digital content creation business. And they consult for major companies such as P&G, Ralph Lauren, Home Depot, to name a few. A major highlight is creating the Olympics, uh, uber successful Raising an Olympian campaign, which was done in conjunction with the IOC, P&G, and Yahoo. And if that isn't enough, a few years ago, Roger does a complete 180 and moves into remote slash extreme wildlife and nature adventures, photography, and filmmaking. This includes sailing the Drake Passage three times to capture film and photos of icebergs and penguins and whales in the Antarctic Peninsula and cheetahs and lions and elephants in Africa. He has also done amazing aerial photography on helicopters all over the world from Iceland to Africa and the Australian outback. With this work, Roger actively collaborates with environmental nonprofits such as Conservation International, Woods Hole, Oceanographic Institution, and more. Additionally, he has been collaborating with an amazing range of musical artists, combining their art form with his art form of photography and film to create music videos celebrating Mother Earth with great artists such as Herbie Hancock, Emily Bear, Burt Alice Williams, and many more. Lastly, and most importantly, as DC alluded to, Roger's number one focus is his teenage son, Jack, who he wrote a book called What I Know, Uncommon Wisdom and Universal Truth from 10-year-olds and 100-year-olds. And you can find that on Amazon, folks. Brand nerds, this is going to be very special. Welcome to Brands, Beats, and Bites, Roger Fishman. Thank you very much. That was very, very generous. And I appreciate the incredibly wonderful uh, opening sentiment. So thank you, everybody. And thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah, all right, brand nerds, this is my boy. So you know him as Roger Fishman. I refer to him lovingly as Fish. So that's what you're going to hear me say. All right, Fish, a couple things. Uh, brand nerds, we've done 120, 130 or so of these podcasts. Every one of them where, where, where it's really done well, Larry has given our guests, their flowers. So Fish, you got your flowers there. Larry does that thank you. Uh, it, very eloquently. You're quite welcome. And thank you, Larry. But of all of the 130 or so uh, episodes that we've had for you brand nerds that have listened across 50 different countries, I don't think, Larry, we've ever had one begin with the personal side, the nope. personal story. And so Fish... 
you st- you helping us better understand who you are before what you do. I'm um I I think that's impressive. And then brand nerds, I want to I want to talk about um, two other things. One is vulnerability. It's not easy to be vulnerable, but when we are vulnerable, we find our strength. Yeah. Another second thing, brand nerds, is that seventy five percent of high achievers come from troubled families, 75, 75%. I'm one of them. Fish and I talked about this and Fish shared uh, some of that with us uh, in the podcast. So for you brand nerds that are out there and you're thinking, oh, this is what was going on with my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, my siblings, my, my cousins, and it wasn't good, it's okay, it's all right. I recently heard someone talk about uh, Fish and Larry um, that if struggles that we have as a children do not break us, they build us. Mm. And then this morning I was listening to um, uh, a pastor. I'm not trying to make this all religious, but I just want to tell you what I heard this morning. This lady had a wonderful analog. I wish I could remember her name because I would... uh, uh, credit her with this. So this is hers, not mine. Uh, we'll find it and put it in the uh, in the show notes. She talked about uh, life like an egg. If you break an egg from the outside, it means death. But if you break it from the inside, it means life. Hmm. And so, Fish, you have a story of breaking an egg from the inside to yep. give you more life. All right. We are now moving into get comfy. Get comfy, fish. I got two for you, brother. Two for you. The first one is uh we're going to go back to the Coca-Cola days, but let me give a little context here. So I met Fish in the uh, in the 90s at Coca-Cola, so did Larry. Now, uh brand nerds, there is a source called Interbrand. Interbrand ranks the 100 global brands based on value. In other words, if you're number one, you have the most valuable brand in the world. So if you own this brand, the rights of this brand, and you go into Goldman Sachs, they would say, oh, you, you own this brand? They would, get, they would start raining cash down on you. All right, so for the last five years, uh, Fish and Larry, uh, it's been Apple. So Apple's the number one brand. Number two is Microsoft. Three is Amazon four is Google, and five is Samsung. So those are the top five. I'm going to go six, seven, uh, six through 10. Six is Toyota. Seven is Coca-Cola. I'm going to come back to Coca-Cola. Eight is Mercedes-Benz. Nine is Disney. 10 is Nike. All makes sense. So one might, one, one might assume, and I don't think you'd be too far off, that if Apple is number one in terms of brand value, they probably got some pretty smart people working at Apple. Because they're number one. They're not, you're not going to build the number one brand on the planet and have dummies running it. You're going to have li- likely the most elite in terms of corporate athletes, if you will, in the world. Well, when Fish and Larry and I were at the Coca-Cola company in the 90s, same source interbrand, Coca-Cola was number one. And it was number one for 14 straight years. Okay, so that, that that means that what we think of as Apple today, from a brand perspective, was Coca-Cola back then. So my first question to you, Fish, is what was it like? Explain to the brand nerds from your perspective, what was it like working in that environment during that time? You know, that's a, it's a great question. You know, back then, I just remember thinking, what an amazing life and career opportunity it was right. both on the agency side and also when I went to work for the company because they always perform at the highest level, whether it was marketing, branding, strategy, distribution. Um, and I remember, and you'll remember this guys, I remember once having a meeting with uh, the then CEO, Doug Ivester. Yes. And being uh, in entertainment marketing and working for an incredible creative genius, Steve Coonan, uh, mm-hmm. part of what I was responsible for was back then, 
brand integration and product placement. Right. In movies and TV shows. So I went to see Doug, made a presentation, you know, and Doug was always very formal, always had his suit on, his hands, his pants kind of thing. And he looked at me and I always had his jacket on. Remember? Always had the jacket on. Always. Yep. always jacket was always on. And I said to him, you know, Doug, and you know, our goals were X, Y, and Z. Uh, we've, ach oh, we've achieved them, exceeded them by you know, 30 or 40%. Um, and he looked at me and he said, Roger, I want to congratulate you on exceeding your objectives of market share. But until we have 100%, I will not be satisfied. <laughs> and, and that was the meeting. That was it. <laughs> you know, I walked out of there. I was like, I think I got a compliment, but I think I was told I have to do a lot better. <laughs> and, and look, there's always uh, pros and cons of different approaches. But, you know, the company really excelled because in my case, the people I work for and with yep. encouraged me, enabled me, and elevated my perspective on business and life and, and how to uh, imagine a better future in the business world. And so I was surrounded by it, whether it was at the ad agency or when I joined Coca-Cola. You know, everybody was like, okay, how do we do this and make it bigger, better, and more meaningful? Also for the consumer was, it wasn't just a phrase. It was like, how do you meaningfully impact the, the consumer? How do you essentially serve them with our brand and our products? So I, I think it was just a great experience and a privilege to work at a company that was that forward thinking, that driven. And I give a lot of credit, honestly, like I said, to the people I work with and for, whether it was Steve, whether it was Doug, with you know, you guys, it was it was always a very positive proactive, dynamic environment. Yeah, well said. I, I think too, DC and I have talked about this a lot and with, with other folks um, that uh, that we work with at the time. I mentioned, Roger, we were telling you about Michael Moore and other folks like that. The, the level of our level, because we were still relatively young at that time, we had, and I don't know how I ended up there, but we had, we had just the, the, the level of people was amazing. And you just knew that, like you knew you were surrounded by the best of the, like the best and the brightest. And we knew it at the time. And you look back and it's really was the case because the people that have gone on like yourself to do amazing things in the business world is, is pretty profound. No, I agree. I like, and I really like I said, I think leadership set a great example. Yes, they were, they were demanding, but they're also supportive. It, it yeah. works with your hand, right? Like they wanted it world-class results and they wanted accelerated growth, but they also gave you the resources and the tools to go get there. And I think that's a key part of it is seeing what the destination is and also knowing that you have the tool chest, the kit, right? To go figure it all out as a collaborative effort. So true. I Dean, what was that out. line that no, I man. forget who was, was it attributed? Go ahead. What was the line that, you, I don't remember the full line. So you, you take it, you know, about, uh, that with did it Don Keel say it? Oh yeah, yeah, Don Keel about uh, about New Coke when someone asked the question. You you you'll probably remember this fish because of our uh, the um, when Coke Classic came back, it started growing again. It had been flat. Stock started growing again, so the overall health of the company kept going up. And someone uh, posited the question to Don Keel, rest in power, great uh, chief operating officer of the Coca Cola Company and board member. Did you all do that intentionally? Was that planned? And the line was, we're not that smart and we're not that dumb. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that that was the line. That, yeah. that was the line. Uh all right, Fish. One more um on the on the get comfy, uh, my brother. Uh, this fork in the road that I posited at the top. You grew up in Marketing, branding, communications, strategy, uh, all of these disciplines in marketing, uh, advertising, um, yet you have found yourself in the area of filmmaking and photography and nature. What's up with that, homie? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's a great question. I think there's two things I would say at least. One is they're, they're all connected because they're all about storytelling. Mm. Right. right. I mean, our each of our lives are stories, right? Right. Just, and, and each of those lives have lessons learned along the way and, and what they mean to us and how we uh, manifest them. 
I think is key. So to all, everything you talked about sounds separate and different, but it's storytelling mm. uh, and forms of it. And I think and part of it was what you both touched on earlier. Also, you know, knowing your own truth and trying to live it, mm -hmm. right? And so to me, each part of my life, that to me, a job is really your, part of your career, but your career is part of your life. It was true to me because I was really living and working in places that were important to me, creating skills that were important to me, right? Creating a better future, because ultimately it's about having freedom and choice in your life. To me, your career is about creating a, a life environment where you can live yourself as truly as possible, but you have to know yourself. Um, and so it's back to what you touched on earlier about you know people making choices left or right. And I don't think that they're mutually exclusive. I think you can have a great career and also be true to yourself. And also, yeah. and how you see it, is it a one lane highway? Is it a two lane highway? Or frankly, is it is it planet earth and the universe that you wanna live in? Mm. You have to make those decisions. And I think sometimes mm. we're so focused either with our heads up or heads down that we forget that it's not an either or, it can be yeah. both, it's just at different times, which is why I named my company Zoom In, Zoom Out, because sometimes in life you need to be really specific and tactical, right? And sometimes you need big picture and strategic, but it's rarely an either or because they work in harmony. Right. We're kind of balancing things out and that's how it is in life, right? We're trying to balance our life out with our aspirations, our personal dreams, our family life, whatever it may be. So to me, they all come together and work together. It's a hell of a point. Yep. Hell of a point. Uh, Larry, anything more here before I make a comment and then we move on to uh, the next segment? All you. All right. Uh, Fish, you talked about the smart people that we worked around, you, me, and Larry, and many others. And you specifically mentioned Coonan. So I want to shout out Coonan. Yeah. Uh, guys, uh, Coonan right now is the CEO of the Hawks and all that involves the uh, the Hawks here in Atlanta, which is, uh, as some of you all may or may not know, I'm here in Atlanta. Fish is out in um, in Cali uh, and then uh, with, with Larry. But I remember, uh, Fish, you may remember uh, remember this as well. Coonan, I don't know if this is real or lore, he had an idea to paint the Spencerian script of the Coca-Cola uh, brand on the moon. True. So, yeah, True okay, so, so when we talk about like, people say, what's a moonshot? This yeah. is the kind of stuff that was going on in front of us in the yeah. 90s. Like, legit, this dude wanted to do that. And then also, a uh, uh, big shout out to uh, to Coonan. He personally helped me on the Sprite brand, uh, he and the team, uh, with what they did with regard to this fusing of entertainment and sports uh, with our brand. One of the things that Coonan did... Um, it, it, it makes me sad the story behind this, which I won't go into, but I'm happy that we had the opportunity is uh, uh, Coonan was the lead in getting Kobe Bryant on uh, on my brand, the Sprite brand back in the day. So rest in power. So I just wanted to shout out Coonan. Yeah. Now, like he, uh, Steve, you know, when I worked with him and for him, uh, he, by how he is, he let you know that imagination. Mm hmm possibility, not probability, possibility was the world to live in. And he would, I remember the time he, he made a pitch to Doug and afterwards we had a discussion about, well, is it even possible? He goes, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And I think that's one of the, the things is it wasn't, there was a limitless perspective. And I think as a brand person and a marketing person or just living your life, it's how do you open up possibilities? How do you open up potential and not look for it. I need this result. I need this. I need to get this number because you start to then take out all the upside because you're, you're playing to deliver something specific mm -hmm. so is creating really a macro upside to both the consumer, the brand and all the parties involved and also to yourself. So I, I know we have to do both, but I think yeah. you have to start with potential, not probability. Great. Great fish. All right, LT, uh, you ready to take it to our, our sponsor read, our wonderful sponsor? I am happy to take it. We're going to do our specificity read. Hey, brand nerds, back here to talk to you about specificity. And brand nerds, we know many of you are immersed in digital marketing, 
or just simply involved in it. Either way, if you want to optimize your digital marketing to maximize results, we have the solution for you. In 2021, an interesting thing happened that forever changed the landscape of digital marketing. Apple's iOS update was structured to provide users the opportunity to opt out of ads, and more than 90% of users opted out. Android quickly followed suit with similar opt-out numbers. This situation created complete upheaval for the entire digital marketing infrastructure with engagement rates falling precipitously. Now you know why you may be a 22-year-old female playing your favorite game app on your phone and all of a sudden you're being hit with an in-app ad for Rogue Game. That's serious money down the drain. Here's where specificity comes in to save the day. Specificity does not track or know users' personal data such as name, social security number, et cetera. Specificity uses device ID numbers similar to a VIN number on a car, so they track what users are doing without knowing their personally identifiable information, working in harmony with the post-privacy update. Now with specificity, both the consumer and the advertiser are happy since consumers see digital ads that are relevant for them and advertisers serve ads to people that are receptive to the message. Let's give a real life example. If Jeff Soul brand Lunchables wanted to use specificity, they can serve ads to only parents, not just to any parent, they can dial into serving ads to only working parents of let's say children six to 12. Additionally, if they wanted to, they could also not serve ads to any parents who are vegetarians or other similar dietary restrictions who would not be prone to buy Lunchables. The bottom line is this would enable Lunchables to be incredibly efficient in serving their message only to those who would be most receptive and doing it in a way that completely respects said consumer's privacy since they do not know or learn any personal information about these people. The bottom line is in 2023, we believe no one else out there can deliver better digital marketing results than specificity. We have introduced specificity to many clients and everyone is super happy since each client has been more successful with their digital marketing efforts than they were before. For more information on specificity, please visit their website at specificityinc.com. Again, specificityinc.com. That's S-P-E-C-I-F-I-C-I-T-Y-I-N-C.com. Their website is also on our show notes. If you want to improve your digital marketing results, go check them out. All right, Larry, we're going to move to the next segment, and it is called Five Questions. It's five questions. All right, Fish, here we go. Larry, five questions. This is the way it goes down, Fish. I ask okay. a question, Larry asks one, back and forth until we arrive at five. Okay. Here we go. First question is, take us back a bit, Fish. Tell us about the experience that you had with a brand. Um, it can be in any domain where it just blew your mind. You were so into this brand. You love this brand. It almost felt like a first love to you. Like, wow, what, what an experience. What a fill in the blank. What was that first brand experience for you? Well, it's a great question. I had actually probably three, but I'll, I'll try to limit this. You know, I started my career uh, in database direct marketing, and it was Time Life Books, you know, and that was all about understanding your consumer, getting results back, measuring everything, which is what the internet's all about, too. Uh, but I, as part of that series, I learned so much about how to attract the consumer's attention in the first three seconds, mm -hmm. how to get them to want to buy multiple products, right? The lifetime value. Mm -hmm. and, and I started to think about everything differently because I was like, okay, this relationship can be over multiple years. Right. Mm -hmm. And as part of that, I got to, I got to meet Vincent Price. If you remember Vincent Price. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and we shot a commercial with him, and I was like, all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, we're, we're literally going to someone's house these products right mm -hmm. and we're on their bookshelf and they are literally part of how they will experience life because they're making the decision not me they're making the decision every month to buy this product right because every month it came in mm -hmm. and if they didn't want it they just canceled so you want to constantly be proving value to your customer mm -hmm. And I thought, like, uh, what a great way. You actually have to serve, literally serve the customer. Not sell them, serve them on an emotional level, a functional level, a psychological level. 
And that required to really study who was buying, and by the way, who wasn't and why. And that was the key part about database marketing, because when I started, it was only about who. And then I was like, but why aren't 98% of the people buying, right? You get a 2% response and you're thrilled. I'm like, yeah, but 98% mm -hmm. are saying no. So we started mm -hmm. doing qualitative, which was actually new for that part of the industry. And then I started falling in love with the psychology of people. Like, why do people make decisions? What does it tell you about them? What does it tell them about them? Mm -hmm. uh, and then when I transitioned over, one of the products I fell in love with, believe it or not, was CoverGirl makeup. Uh... Because I learned that there were five ways to get your skin ready for makeup. And I thought, well, well that's brand new to me. Like, it was so part, mm -hmm. part of my life. Mm -hmm. And then I, we did focus groups. And I, you, back then, you'd hear people say, well, I, I put makeup on before my, my boyfriend or husband wakes up. And you're like, but why? So you got to go deeper and deeper into the psychology mm -hmm. of who we are. It was like anthropological in a way. Um, so I found that the more that I got involved deeper with the consumer and the more I got deeper into really the brand, that every, my life just changed for the better because I felt like I became part of something bigger. Because now I was understanding someone, uh, literally their emotional life dynamics and how our products and really the brands, right? Not products, brands enhance that motivate people, fit in, and, and change their lives. So I would say, you know, those two at the beginning of my career were some of the biggest game changers uh, in, in how I looked at my entire life because they were also so different than my life. I like Diet Coke, when I worked in that, I loved it for a range of reasons, but it was part of my life. I, in a way, understood it because I grew up with right. it. I'm my books and, and cover girl, completely new, completely changed me. Because it was not, I was not the target audience. So I had to become much more open to understanding a different person, a different product, a different narrative, a different story than I'd ever experienced before. And that to me was a thrill. <laughs> Dee, I want to point something out here to the brand nerds. Mm -hmm. When Roger tells that, he goes to both left brain and right brain, mm -hmm. if you notice that. He talked about really understanding the psychology of people, really getting into each other, into the consumer's head, really understanding the consumer. But yet also, then the action is much more left brain, right, of, of really understanding the performance metrics, right? And what Roger does seamlessly, brand nerds, is what the best marketers do. You have to synthesize both and really balance both. And Roger alluded to balance in his personal life. But that's what the best marketers do. If you're all right brain, you got a problem. If you're all left brain and don't understand that there's a psychological components and the emotional connections with people, you're also that you're, you're not going to succeed. You've got to have the balance of both. And I just wanted to point that out that Roger just does that. No, well, look at, thank you. And also for me, it's more fun. And when I was at the ad agency, you know, we were pitching a, uh, a new product. It was going to be a semi-permanent hair coloring product. Mm -hmm. That the whole premise What does was that mean, product. by the way? Semi-permanent? Well, well, permanent hair coloring, my understanding from years ago, was it, it literally rips out all the color and, and takes the follicle, strips it bare, and then puts color in so it lasts longer. Wow. Ah. This is going to be a semi-permanent, but it had the same impact, which is you didn't have to strip out your follicle, so it didn't change the texture of your hair, and it, but it coated your hair. Okay, so you had the, the benefit of your hair staying healthier and softer, and at the same time, you it lasted as long. Okay, so less Got damage to the same benefit. So I was like, okay, we're pitching this business by business that was ultimately you know purchased by Procter and Gamble, which was Noxell. So on my own, I went out to a local drugstore and I bought some semi permanent hair coloring products, and I went back to my little studio apartment and I took out the little gloves, I took out the product, and I put my head under the, the tub and I just started doing it. And in yeah. the experience, you know, obviously my hands were really made for those little plastic gloves, but I went through it and I could see the experience literally wash as I washed it out, the hair coloring dye was going into the tub and it was just messy and, and horrible. Yeah. Uh, but I, I enjoyed it because I was like, wow, this is a new way to learn. And actually now I could understand it better. Right. When we pitched the client and it was a big, big piece of business, uh, I went up there and they, everyone on the agency side was like, tell them what you did. And I said, well, I went out and I, and I took them through the whole process. They're like, you actually 
bought a women's hair coloring product. <laughs> I bought several of them. I bought different colors because I wanted to see how the different colors would work. Right. And so I went through it and they just looked at me. They're like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and they also had tremendous respect for it, right? Because I was living the customer experience. Yep. yep. I was going through what the customer was doing. So this is, you know, 35 years ago. And I was out there trying women's hair coloring products. And I, I do believe that we have to, to serve somebody, you have to understand what they go through in their lives, in, their, in that category experience, and where you can best fit and help them with whatever their emotional or functional needs are or both. And for me, that was part of the joy of doing it. Like, I love doing that. I, I, just one side story. When I worked on CoverGirl, you know, I, I bought all these products to test them out. And one day, you know, I, my girlfriend came over at the time and she was coming up to the door and she knocked on the door and I was like, oh no, I just literally taken a whole bottle. I didn't know how to do this. A whole bottle of CoverGirl, sh literally shaking it, shake it all into my hand, put it all over my face. And I was like, I didn't realize I wasn't supposed to put so much in my face. So all of a sudden I heard knock, knock, knock. And I'm like, oh no. I'm like, well, she'll just have to like see me like this. I opened the door. I have just like a whole bottle of makeup dripping down my face. Cake <laughs> And she's like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, well, I'm testing out a product you know, for my client. And, you know, to me, that was actually the joy of it. It was no matter what it was, I've always felt what a gift it is to be able to help brand and market and collaborate with other smart people. But always under the premise that it has to be to improve somebody else's lives. It can't just be about how do you sell? It's like, how do we improve their life? It could be uh, momentarily. It can be long term. But at the core of the notion of serving people and not selling people, to me, is, is critically important. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Love that. Larry, next question. Okay, Roger. So uh, who has had or is having the most influence on your career? At this stage? Could be anywhere, anytime, whatever you deem most important in your life. You know, I, I, I'm going to say three people, just I'll, I'll, one, my yeah. father, my father who died, my mother who worked her ass off six days a week, keep a roof overhead, clean clothes, in my back and food in my stomach and my son. And I say that for the following, my father, because of his early death, his fourth heart attack at 46, told me life is short. So I'm always had the notion of like, be in the moment, have gratitude for what you have. Okay and realize what priorities are for you and live intentionally. My mother talked to me about work ethic, uh, prince being principle-based, honorably based and earning your way through life and owning it all, good or bad, intended or unintended. She got up in the middle of the winter at six o'clock in the morning. She was out the door at 6.30. I'd push her car up the driveway if it was snowing or icy and she just did it. So she influenced me to understand you, you earn your way through life. Life is not given to you. You earn it and you own it. And the third part of that is my son. You know, I'm so in love with my son. He's in the, as we all feel, I'm sure about our children. You know, he's my priority. He's my focus. And as my father once wrote a few days before he died, he wrote a note to his twin sister. Um, and he said, you know, Roger you know, is the son, S-U-N, of my life. Um, that's what my son is. Mm. So... That's that's my focus. So those are the three that are always driving. Yes, there are great people professionally that influence me. We talked to some of them. There's obviously both of you I've collaborated with. But at the end of the day, who's always in my life? Those three people, always and every day. Oh, man, I love that, Roger, because that shows, and it, it is emotional, because that shows that the, that's the core of who you are. Um, and everything, like you said, revolves around that. So. That's beautiful. Also, just, you know, I think it's the core of what we all are. And I think yes. that sometimes the, the, the mask of business, I always think, no, my, my metaphor is always an iceberg. I'm, as you know, I photograph icebergs from helicopters all over Greenland. I always say, you know, the top 10%, right? That's the external. That's the slippery slope, right? The 90% below, that's the depth. That's where we all live. And I, when we're yeah. in business, we, we sometimes forget that that other person has their own dreams, their own desires, their own sadness. And we get caught up in results, results, results. We also have to realize that we can get there, but we can also get there with compassion, empathy, and kindness. And if we understand each other on the other 90%, a little bit deeper, that 
a lot more fun, a lot more easy, and a lot more attainable. And so I, I try to make sure I, I always maintain both of that, you know, the, the external and the internal and how I live and, and how I, I think and act. Ooh. You know, you conducted yourself that way when we first knew you. And, and I think you're even more aware of it now, which is the natural evolution of people, but you've always been that way. And, um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fish. Uh, on our podcast, uh, Fish, we like to uh, acknowledge and bring honor to family members. So you've mentioned your son, Jack. Yeah. Uh, what What is your father's name? Uh, Ronald Ludwig Ronald. Fishman. And okay, uh, he had a sister. And uh, yeah, he died at 46. 46, okay. And my mother is Carol Block Fishman, and she is 94 and still alive. How about that? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. All right, D. You want to move to the next question? That was just, that, that was awesome, Roger. Thank you. I do. Thank thank you. I do. All right. You have an esteemed career. You've done various and sundry things. You have met the fork in the road and consistently picked the direction that worked for you, not only professionally, but personally. So you've had some successes but you've also had some failures. And that is the heart of this question. <laughs> Two-part question. Your biggest F-up of all time. The greatest F-up of all time. <laughs> and what you, and importantly, what you learned from it. Yeah, I, I think my F-up, and it's probably been consistent when I, when I do fuck up, is... I didn't take the time to pause. Mm -hmm. You know, I I didn't take the time to really count and say, let me just think about that. I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that it, that was partially because of my childhood and, and the triggers that happened. Mm -hmm. And I never, I learned, but I learned later in life that the best response is often I like to think about that. Thank you for sharing. And let me let me get back to you tomorrow on that. And I think that's my biggest F up is doing the, not doing that professionally or personally. Mm. Like allowing emotion to carry too much weight. Emotion's always going to carry weight, right? We're emotional beings. Right. That's what branding is about, right? It's like capturing the emotion of a brand and a consumer and bringing it together in a, in a more you know uh, elevated way. I think professionally, my career, it was, it would have been helpful if I just paused and just said, you know what, I'm going to count to 10. I'm going to think about that. I'm going to get back to you. And always been uh, ready to just take my time, take my time. Because I think in the heat of the moment, we're always trying to answer. We're always trying to be smart. We're always trying to uh, move ahead. Whatever it may be, we're always trying to protect ourselves. Sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? That's a great question or thank you for that. And I'd like to think about that. That I say is probably a theme that I could have worked on earlier in my career. I could have, I should have. That's so deep. <laughs> That's so good. Uh, D, can, do you mind if I follow on this one? Mm -hmm. Please. So Roger, um, I love that. I think everyone on earth can relate to what you just said. Um, and I want to say this to the brand nerds out there, the younger brand nerds out there. Um, what Roger's saying is so huge. If you say, hey, I need time to think about it. Let me get back to you. And people don't honor that. They're just telling you that you don't want to work with them. Mm -hmm. right? So there, that is the perfect thing to do at all times, unless you're facing a life in that situation and alligators chasing you at the moment, right? Unless it's fight or flight at that moment, that is really the best way to handle any situation. And if somebody uh, hits you back, like I said, they're just showing you, they're showing you their cards and they're telling you basically to run away. Well, Larry, I think what you're also really saying, which is super important for everyone, especially younger in the career, to realize, you know, it's your career is a two-way street, right? That's right. People are telling you like, 
whether they want you here or not. And yep. you get to say, do I want to be here or not? That's right. right. And so people are giving you information. It's like, you know, like a bat with radar. They're giving you data points. And you want someone who's going to respect you, to, to lead you, to be supportive, to ask you questions. And the truth is, we don't always have the answer because there's rarely the answer. I always say, like, I, that's why in business, we think, oh, who's the expert? Well, experts are right 50% of the time. Because, <laughs> and right? that's a good percentage. Yeah, because there's always the other half of the experts that are wrong 50% of the time. Right. And so I, if everyone knew the answer, there wouldn't be an industry for everybody else, like consultants or venture capital firms or private equity, right? Mm -hmm. You wouldn't need all this other you know, you know, training. The truth is we're, most people are doing the best they can. Most people want to keep their job, right? And improve their lot in life. And most people just want to be in a healthy environment. Most people don't need their own way. They just want to know that there, there's a, multiple ways to be successful in a company, mm -hmm. in a collaborative way. So I think people want to give support and want support. And I think that's really where I believe your point is so important. If someone is giving you a message that says, no, we don't want your opinion, we don't want to hear from you, or you have to do it this way, I mean, then you go, well, is that right for me? Right. And so I think that's what you said is critically important for everyone listening. Pay attention to the, not only the people around you, but the people above you, because that, that's where you're heading, right? Is you want to head up. That's right. You want to head forward. Yo, Fish, do you remember one of our colleagues? Uh, his name is Jeff Herbert. He was the son of Ike Herbert. Sure. Who ran the presence. Uh, we called it presence back in the day, brand nerds, but it was entertainment and sports before Conan did. Yeah. So Jeff Herbert, his son, uh, grew up at the Coca-Cola company, as many of us did, and went on to senior roles at the Coca-Cola company and uh, and beyond. Uh, Herbert was an was an extreme straight shooter. So here is what he used to say as it relates to this wonderful point you have shared with the brand nerds. That, hey, let me let me think about that. Let, let me give me a moment. Let me come back to you. Herbert used to say this. If you don't know the answer, don't try to pretend like you know the answer. Right. Because if you try to pretend like you know the answer and you're wrong. I, and I quote, I'm going to think you're, you're a dumbass. Okay. So th this, this was Herbert. So that's one reason brand nerds to do exactly what fish is saying, give yourself some time. Yep. But the second one is, uh, is personal. And I hadn't thought about this until you just shared it. Uh, I grew up, uh, some of you brand nerds know, um, where I believe that love and life were a combination of three C's, chaos, conflict, and criticism. So that was love for me. That was life for me. If, if I weren't getting those three things, I didn't think I was in a loving place and I didn't think I was fully living. Uh, I won't go into all of the background now. Fish knows, uh, uh, knows some of it because he and I talked about this. So maybe on another occasion I'll go into this brand notice, but right now I won't, but just chaos, conflict, and criticism. So because of that, I ended up showing up in the world where when things got more chaotic, I would slow down some. Personally, what this looked like is having a relationship with someone and they are beginning to get animated and I'm becoming more calm. Mm -hmm. So I'd never found myself in a situation where I was like, oh, you know what? I need to have a day to think about this. Let me get back to you. Because right. I was able to slow myself down in those moments because of some of the trauma that I experienced and my coping mechanisms as a child to then answer the question. That said, it doesn't mean I still should not have and still should not ask for the gift of time. I can still do that. So brand nerds, even for those of you out there who think you might have the answer in the moment, still give yourself the permission that Fish has just said to go, you know, let me get back to you. Yep. And, and to that point, Daryl, you know, great leadership will respect it. That's yeah. right. 
great Correct. leadership says, you know what, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I, and then they'll tell you, I need to hear back from the end of the day tomorrow. But that yeah. is the sound of, of I think smart leadership is giving people the time yeah. to be thoughtful yeah. and to really consider the, the situation holistically. Great point. Uh, thanks, Fish. All right, uh, Larry, next question, Broski. All right, Roger. Regarding technology and marketing, you have seen a lot. Uh, can you tell us where you think marketers should lean in or best leverage tech or areas that you think that they should be leery or simply avoid? Like I think for the future, you know, around marketing and storytelling, whether we like it or not, people need to understand AI. Yep. Mm -hmm. I think on, on every level, how you market, how you build your brand, how you create content. I think it's going to be amazingly powerful. I think there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty, but there's no question that you can now create commercials, you can create movies, right, without human beings in them, mm -hmm. right? You can mm -hmm. measure results on a much more real-time basis and now create stories back on a real-time basis. Mm -hmm. I think we're entering a world where you have to be both strategic, but you have to be real-time. And to me, that's going to be the future, is how do you be brand consistent, but also brand timely? And that to me is no question in my mind, the biggest shift that's that's happening and will continue to happen. Look, it's one of the core issues going on right now in, in the writer's strike. And the no actors, question. Right? So yeah. if it's happening at that big level, people are thinking, oh my gosh, they, they can take my likeness now and make other right. movies without me. Guess mm -hmm. what's going to happen in, the, in every world? Mm -hmm. So that to me would be a, a area for everyone to focus on. doesn't matter whether it's an agency, a, con a company person, uh, distribution, wherever you will play, that's going to be a core part of it. Mm. Totally agree. Uh, <laughs> but I think what you're also seeing, Roger, by bringing it up is it's there, for, it's there whether you like it or not. So you're better served to lean in and figure it out and embrace it. Yeah. Well, okay, years ago, think about it. I remember years ago, I was having actually, I'm sure Daryl knows the gentleman, he's head of one of the largest music labels. And it was, there was, you know, downloading and streaming and all this yep. stuff. And the gentleman said to me, we're going to, we're going to sue the people who are downloading the music. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, what do you, what do you mean you're going to sue? And he goes, yeah, we're going to sue this old lady, sue this young kid. So everyone knows that they can't do this. Oh God. And I just said to him, I said, it's inevitable. You have to change your business model. No. Nope. Yep. We're going to stop this. How'd that work yeah. out? Yeah. And the same thing with Kodak. Film. Yeah. Broke up. Not digital. Music. You can debate whether you like records or 45s all you want. Right. Mm -hmm. That's not the question. The question is, if you're a business person, where's it going? Right. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to both acknowledge reality and then figure out how to leverage it to our advantage and get our personal preferences sometimes out of it. And yep. just say, what's best for the consumer? You know, I'm so glad you brought that up. We talk about this all the time. And we learned this, you know, at Coke to a great, in a great way. It always goes back to what's best for the consumer. You said it before, serve, not sell, right? And what's best for the consumer and what's best for the brand. And the confluence of those things are such that you're in 2023 going forward and AI, we're at the very beginning of it. And you got to figure it out. And it's doing amazing things. We have a couple of, of previous guests on this show. Seth Greenberg, who's CMO of Veritone, which is right in the heart of, of AI. And uh, Ed Collins, who we work with. And Ed has a podcast that he's developed with our podfather um, here, Tom Dioro, where they have a podcast that's an AI voice. And I, and I dare anyone, if they heard it, if they didn't know it, they would never know that it's, a, it's an AI voice. It's incredible. And look, there's, you, we can discuss and debate ethical and moral considerations for large and right. all of it, but at the end of the day, it's inevitable. And I think yep. we have to like, so I go, let's have the other one debate over here, but you got to deal with reality as well. Yep. I'm going to pick up on that point, Fish, before we go to the final question. Let's parallel the music executive that you mentioned and what was going on in the music business with digital downloads with AI. 
uh, Jeff Waterman, who also worked at the Coca-Cola company with us, he has a quote. I love this brother's quotes. He says, you know, a problem is a problem because it has a solution. If the problem does not have a solution, it is a reality. <laughs> okay. That is that is a quote for the ages. Yeah. AI brand nerds is a reality. It, yep. It's a reality. What's it going to change in business? I think it's going to be seismic and fundamental in, 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 in this way. Most people in business, fish and LT, establish their careers based on their ability to answer questions, answer questions, answer complicated questions. This is why most folks write, oh, wow, if we go to Fish and ask him this question, he's going to solve it for us. Okay, well, brand nerds, guess what? AI is going to now be answering the questions, which means they're going to be providing the answers to the questions, which means we got to flip. We now have to be better at crafting and asking better questions. Right. And by asking better questions to AI, we can thereby put ourselves in position to get better answers. It is a fundamental shift yep. in the psyche and the skill set of business people. And fortunately, in our line of work and in yours, Fish, we kind of like ads asking questions. <laughs> Good questions. Well, That's you, right. You see, to that point, if I got like to me, what you just talked about is the notion of now we start to get to wander and wonder, right? So in order to ask the right questions. And mm -hmm. you don't say we have to have the answer. No, nope. right. when, when you have to have the answer, you've already decided upon the questions. Correct. Yes. So if you're just forcing it to where you want to be. That's right. But when That's I right. go, when I go on my adventures now, if I go to Greenland or Namibia, people say, Well, what what's your project? Like, what are you trying to go? What are you going to go do? And I go, I'm just going to go explore. I'm going to go create. I'm going to wander. And when I come back, I will have asked myself questions. I'll have wandered through these new worlds, right? open up different parts of my neurons and synapses, and then I will figure out what the answer is. But wow. I never go predetermined. I think as business people, we want, we want a predetermined outcome because it's always like 90 days, get the result yeah. in 90 days. But the way to get the result is not to go for the result. The thing is to go for the opportunity. And that yeah. means living in the unknown, the uncertain, and living in the curiosity of the opportunity. And that's what I think, you know, Daryl, you're talking about, which is asking different questions, new questions, and with less constraints. Correct. Thank you, uh, Fish. Wonderfully um, summarized. Last question, speaking of questions. Uh, what are you most proud of, brother? What are you most life? proud of? Oh, my entire life. What, however you wanted to answer that. My, my son. Yeah. It's not even close. Like, there's nothing. Like, I, I, somebody asked me recently, I said, well, you know, talk about all the people you've dealt with in your life professionally. And I work for Peter Chernin, and people know Peter. Peter's one of the leading entertainment and media executives in the world and does private equity work for two capitals, movies, television. He was president of News Corp. Peter's phenomenal. One of the most amazing executives, in fact, the most amazing I've ever worked for. I work with Rupert Murdoch, Lock of Murdochs. I've worked with Ralph Lauren. I've worked with Spielberg, all these people, right? Music industry people. It's all, that's great, but nothing comes close. I mean, literally, nothing comes close to what I'm proud, more proud of than being a father to my son. You know, we just came back from a trip to Europe and Africa, to Kenya, and it was the most exquisite three weeks of my entire life. So um, by, by a long shot, it's, it's my son. That's what I'm most proud of. And, and being there for him, is one of the greatest gifts I've ever given myself to become free of everyone else's interest and expectations and my focus on what's my purpose here in life. And that's to be the best father possible. Yeah, that's amazing, Roger. How often have you taken Jack 
on your on these wonderful adventures? Well, the adventures I take with him are different than the ones I go on. Okay. And they're more extreme, more risk, honestly. You know, taking helicopter trips over the Denmark Sea for four and a half hours and then circumnavigating Greenland in a helicopter. Right. But no, he and I have gone scuba diving, you know, in Tahiti. You know, we were hiking down in Patagonia uh, this past year. We just came back from Africa. We'll, we'll go lobster diving in a month, you know, and all things that he wants to do. Oh, awesome. About what most interests him. So that's where I try to get to, which is, and what can he, he learn from each of these experiences that opens his mind, opens his heart, right, and soul, and can give him a different perspective on life. Because I think at the end of the day, how we feel about life based on our experiences is how we see life, right? We feel life, and then we see life that way. So I want him to have feelings across all types of cultures, uh, histories, whether it's people, food, you know, whether it's you know, from Africa, Europe, America, it, different activities. So he gets to open up and he gets to decide what it means for him. My job isn't to tell him. My, my responsibility is to open up the world for him and let him decide which doors to go through. Love it. That's so great. That's a capstone on that. That's awesome. Woo! D, this is, how great has this been with Roger? As, as I thought it would be. <laughs> Me too. It has been phenomenal. Yes. All right, Roger. We're uh, we're close to the end here. We uh, we posit our learnings, and um, I do the uh, the real easy part, the easy ones, which become uh, uh, hopefully things that our brand nerds take away, and then and and then DC just he puts it together like no one else can. So I'm going to start. Um, so I've got a bunch. I'm trying to call them down. There were so many nuggets, brand nerds. I would say you need to listen to this episode twice. But here's seven that I've tried to call down. So I'm going to start with the number one, know your own truth and try to live it. Roger said that very early, right? Um, from a marketing standpoint, serving people, not selling people. Uh, great marketers, as Roger talked about with the time life book situation early in his career, this means really getting into the psychology of consumers. So you're serving them, not selling them. Um, number three, to be the best marketer, you have to go all in like Roger did with the semi-permanent hair color. You just got to get all in, brand nerds, and get your hands dirty and be all about it. Number four, you, Roger's, Roger's mother, uh, you earn your way through, your, through life and you own it. You earn your way through life and you own it. Just love that one. Number five, get results. Yes, but you can get results with compassion, empathy, and kindness. Six, best response, as Roger, Roger talked about in his up. the best response is, hey, let me get back to you. Best response. And then my last one, number seven, is live in the curiosity of the opportunity. That's so deep. Mm. Can't believe we reached the end, LT. I know. You and I have uh, found ourselves in a similar uh, place. Um, Roger Fishman, um, we haven't seen each other live in uh, many, many years, um, many years. I need you to know I love you, brother. I love you guys, too. And thank you, brother. I really mean it for reconnecting both on a personal human level as well as on this wonderful podcast. I want to thank ben. Larry. You know, we're almost neighbors. You're up north. I'm down south. Oh, so man. We'll Roger, can't wait to see you. Roger and I are already making plans to do that. We yeah. You know, we like have I, a special connection. We all love each other, Roger. It's awesome. I think I think that's the nice. big part for me is you know you you realize at the end of it all, it's not the yeah. awards, it's not even the results. Truthfully, it's the connections and the relationships and and the yeah. goodness, right? That keeps you going. So to both of you, thank you. I love you guys. And I look well, now, you I'm not done yet. Now, fish. Oh, oh, sorry, man. <laughs> no, 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 no. I know you didn't know that. I didn't. You didn't know that. I'm 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 gonna share some things about your brother before you go. So sorry. Okay. I know you you big, didn't know that was big. coming. That's all right. That's okay. That's, That's all right. All right. So uh, three things and then a takeaway. So fish. At the end of these experiences, I do my best to coalesce. Really, listen to not only what I'm 
uh, hearing people say, but what I believe they mean in order for, for me to boil down what I believe might be one of uh, uh, their gifts. And so I'm going to attempt to do that with you uh, right now. I'll make three points and then I'll get to what I think is one of the special gifts you have been sharing with the world and that I believe you'll continue to share with the world. The first goes back to your example about cover girl. You're using hair coloring, you're putting makeup on your face and um, you don't have to do any of that, but you wanted to put yourself in the shoes of the uh, of the folks that you wanted to serve, not sell to your point, Larry, but to serve. Very few people do that, um, Fish, very few. So that's one example. The second one is uh, the work that you're in now, the storytelling around nature. You mentioned Greenland as an example and you're wandering around, wandering around uh, Greenland. And when I've heard you talk about your work, Fish, whether you're in Greenland or in Africa or some other exotic locale, it's not you just pointing the camera at an object called a iceberg. You seem to fuse with it. You become one with nature, not separate and apart from nature. And this, I think, comes from your opening the aperture and allowing yourself to wander. The third is uh, it's Jack, your son, Jack. Larry, when Fish and I were talking about uh, his trip to Patagonia with Jack, he was describing in great detail what Jack was experiencing in Patagonia. It was almost as if he had gone from he being fish from his body into Jack's body. And he was explaining to me what Jack was seeing. And awesome. he was explaining to me what Jack was feeling in Patagonia. And um, he, he, you said this fish, you said, my job, this is about Jack, isn't to tell him it's to open up doors for him. This is what you said. And then finally, you picked up on this, LT. You talked about Fish's quote, living in the curiosity of the opportunity, which brings me to this. I think your gift, Fish, is that you consistently, every day, exhibit strategic empathy. Ooh. This is different than just regular empathy. Right. It is a strategic and intentional empathy. And you do that in your professional life, which allows you to fuse and become one with the objects that you are filming so that you can tell the story of the soul of nature and what it's saying. And you also do that personally by becoming a part of standing in the shoes of your loved ones, Jack and others, and being able to see the world through their eyes. I don't know that I've met another human who does a combination of intentional and strategic empathy like you. This is what I think is your gift, my brother. Thank you very, very much. It's, that's, that means a lot. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. Oh, there oh. It's such a, uh, Roger, this is such a blast and a pleasure to have you on and, and so deep for, uh, for everyone. Do you have any uh, learnings or thoughts that you want to, you want to posit before we uh, sign off? Yeah, look, I think the one is what this podcast is all about is in my case, it's reconnecting with two amazing human beings, right? And staying closer in touch at the end of the day is those connections, right? That, the, the caring and the kindness that really make it all worthwhile. And so for both of you to have reached out and vice versa and for us to connect again means everything. So thank you really mu very much. And thank you for your kind sentiments and your time and making also this, this a fun, enjoyable experience, which is what life should be as well. Oof. 
perfectly summed up, Jade. That's a perfect uh, way to go to the close here. Thanks for listening to the Brands, Beats, and Bites. The executive producers are Jeff Shirley, Daryl D.C. Cobb, and Larry Tame, Haley Cobb, and Jade Tate, and Tom Bioro. That is he. And if you are listening to us via podcast, it would be great if you can please rate and review us. Additionally, if you do like the show, please subscribe and share. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. And we look forward to next time where we will have more insightful and enlightening talk about marketing.